saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the view of Wolfpack Research or any of its officers. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on this program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. We are not investment advisors. We hold no registrations with the SEC, FINRA, or any other regulatory agency, and none of the opinions expressed on this podcast should be considered investment advice. The listener should assume that we have positions in and stand to benefit from any stock or other security mentioned on this podcast. Do your own research before making investment decisions. Okay. Hi, Alec. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I'm just going to get started here for a sec. It looks like you're in your lawyer's office. I haven't been sued. Yeah, not anymore, thank God. Uh, no. Yeah, I haven't been sued all week, so, you know. You haven't been sued all week? Yeah. It's a slow week. Yeah, but, you know, tomorrow's Sunday. We, we start a new week. Um, uh, all right. So just to get started here, welcome to the Wolf Den, everybody. This is Dan David coming back at you with the absolute worst podcast sidekick in the world, <laughs> Sound Carl. Uh, I, I apologize to our guest because Carl was late, and uh, he will he will take more punishment than usual today. For for those of you that listen to the show, what a treat! Our guest today is Alec Berlikoff. He is the former VP of Sales for Insys Pharmaceuticals, among other previous jobs that I'm sure Alec may want to talk about, but it's my show and I want to talk about Insys. <laughs> For those of you uh, that follow our show, you know w- that we have followed Insys for, oh, the better part of 10 years. The whole story, start to finish. So I'm pretty aware of the story and have my own opinion of it. Also had a guest on our show, Evan Hughes. Uh, who was the author of a, a really good book I like called The Hard Sell. And I guess that leads to this, right? So welcome to the show, Alec. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. I do. Well, you know, I, 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 I'll tell you, Alec, I, I give you some credit here. I, you know, hopefully I'll give you more as the, as the show goes along. We'll see. But um, I have to ask you, why did you want to do this show in particular? Because you, you reached out to us. Actually, on several occasions, and I apologize for that too, but you know, I, I, I should, I would like to say to our, our guests not to start out with a downer, not that this story isn't a downer, but Carl had lost his father in between when you'd first reached out to us. And uh, Joe Bubeck was a great man. Uh, and I, I miss him very much. I can't even imagine how you feel, Carl. Uh, but, you know, you know, the legend. Yeah, we've talked about it. So, that's the only break you get here, Carl. Today it's back to work. Uh, no, no slack there. Joe wouldn't have it that way. But it struck me as like you know you, you kept reaching back out, and I think I think you probably heard of us through Evan, right? Yeah, yeah, I heard about you guys through Evan, and obviously I listened to the podcast. Okay, well that's where um, I'm going with this, Alec, because if you yeah. listen to the podcast, I was not very nice to you. No, not uh, not very good things to say about me. So. I'll give you credit for coming on the show and actually, you know, instigating and agitating to be on the show. And with that, what do you have to say? I'm here to listen. Oh, well, no, I appreciate it. I mean, for me, quite honestly, this whole experience from having been in hot water to being indicted and then eventually pleading guilty. Okay. So no, I was just saying that, um, the whole experience for me has just been um, life changing. It's, uh, you know, going back from being in hot water, you know, as a VP in the, uh, in the industry, and then eventually being indicted, uh, coming to the conclusion that I needed to plead, plead guilty uh, to, to move kind of forward in life, and then actually doing the time and, uh, you know, serving my sentence inside as well as uh, on home confinement and then halfway house and now probation. It's, it's a journey for me. It's a day by day opportunity for me to try and grow and ensure that I learn from my mistakes and never again, um, you know, get myself towards that line or that slippery slope, which I've been learning about and talking about a lot, uh, you know, to different universities and so forth. Um, so I'm just, 
I'm just trying to embrace, you know, every opportunity that comes my way, good, bad, or indifferent. And I listened to your podcast and I said to myself, you know, it, it would be good if I could, uh, if I can get on there and um, just hear what they have to say and, you know, take, um, take whatever I have coming to me, you know, not just third party, but even face to face, if that opportunity present. And that's really why I'm here. Face yeah. to music, honestly. I guess that's, that's kind of part of uh, what you've been out there doing since, uh, since your release from band camp. And, you know, that kind of tour isn't unusual. Uh, I, I should say you also wrote a book. I think it's hard lessons. I mean, I guess you and Evan really like titles that start with hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, there, there are some hard lessons in there. Yeah. You know? I, I apologize. I didn't get all the way through it because uh, when I started studying for this yesterday, which is what I do for anything. Fair enough. I, uh, I, uh, I noticed there was a uh, PDF that you had sent. So I'd had that for quite some time and I, I would have gotten through it. But I did get through part of it and starting with, you know, I don't know, Alec. I mean, I think part of my opinion has been that I've watched you. I've watched you and, and, and John Kapoor and Michael Babich, Sunrise Lee and, you know, um, you know pretty much all of them uh, over the years. And I've seen you do interviews, you know, uh, many different times. And as you, as you just said, when I, when I decided I, I, you know, I guess I had to plead guilty, right? Well, right. well, I mean, you were guilty. That's why, that's why you had to plead guilty. And, and, and I mean, some would say you did the smart thing by turning state's evidence and uh, got less of a, uh, a conviction there. I think, I think a sad story in this, and maybe you agree, maybe you don't, and you'll tell us, uh, is Sunrise Lee who really got her ass handed to her for not making any kind of deal. And she might've been the lowest on the totem pole. Yeah. Rico. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, because you brought her into the company, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I did. And, um, you know, when I brought her into the company at that time, I felt good. You know, I felt, well, is that I because she was stripping for you? <laughs> um, no, not really. Um, she did strip. I did meet her in a strip club. Um, and we engaged in conversation and, uh, yeah, I was entertaining customers there. But when I came to the ultimate conclusion that, you know, I would do something that would seem very, very stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, and still, I think it would be impossible to convince people that my decision was anything but stupid. Uh, but anyway, I came to that conclusion that I would hire her and I really thought I was doing something good in some weird yeah. fucked up way. Yeah. Um, and so what happened to her is nothing less than disastrous. Yeah. Um, and it took on a life of its own. You know, when I was in trouble at INSYS and I was, um, you know, told, Hey, you no longer need a civil attorney like everybody else that you mentioned and others, you're in a different category. You now need a criminal attorney. It was only me that needed that criminal attorney, um, never anyone else that you mentioned. And at no point in time, you know, throughout that time. Listen, I think you were being very interesting there and, and hopefully we can yeah. pick it back up. Um, I'm asking you how you felt about what happened to Sunrise Lee, you know, and, um, you know, is catastrophic for her. Uh, yeah. And it was it was really your decision to to bring her into the company for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, I brought her into the company. Um, looking back, the reason I brought her into the company is I thought that she could help me achieve levels of success that I wouldn't be able to achieve without her. And she That's did. That's why I brought her. And she did. Yeah. Yes. Yes, she did, as a matter of fact. Um, but back then, I brought her into the company, quite frankly, for, for what I thought were two reasons. One, I thought she could bring me success um, because I would be doing something that no one has el no one else has done. No one else has gone that far, meaning they hired good looking women, they hired bartenders, they hired waitresses, they hired cheerleaders. And I'm thinking, oh, what's the next step? What's the next level of uh, doing this? And I said, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna hire a stripper. That, that, seems that like should have been the title of your book. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe I would have sold more well, books. Well, but. I mean, it's it's also like, you know, reading about you and, and seeing you, you've always kind of been that guy that's like, what's what's the next level? And a little amoral about it, if not a lot amoral about it. Just like, you know, how do I get over whatever it takes? Is that accurate? You know, Alec, I was saying, you know, it's a it's kind of like you to just, you know, want to go to the next level, no matter what it takes. And it's interesting that you say, because I've obviously made this observation that the pharmaceutical industry is, uh, you know, represented by models, mostly, <laughs> uh, kind of on both sides. Uh, and yeah, I mean, do you find that uh, was an impediment in your life? An impediment in my life to just always try to go to the next level? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, first the first impediment in my life is that you know I wasn't a model and I'm five eight. That's that was my impediment. Hey, man, in there's nothing wrong with being five eight, pal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I tried to compensate, quite frankly, by um, hiring people that um, were shorter than you. Pretty, no, <laughs> taller. Oh. <laughs> It, that would present in a way that, you know, physicians, uh, you know, would be excited to, to engage in dialogue. That's the truth. Um, but as far as the problem for me, um, oddly enough, the fact that I always was pushing myself to go to the next level, it's, it's the reason why I was successful as long as I was, but it was also the reason why internally I was never happy, if that makes any sense. Well, and, um, and also, like, you didn't seem to have a governor on you, right? There was just no speed limit to you. Uh, there's, you know, the being driven and ambitious is, yeah, that's a common theme among successful people, but taking it to, uh, becoming a knowing part of a criminal enterprise, maybe something else. A hundred percent. I mean, I used to complain you know, at my first company, my second company, my third company that they were always telling me, slow down. You can't do this. Stop here. I'd bitch and bitch and bitch. And I would always say, if they would just let me do this, I would be able to do this. Uh -huh. There was a reason why those companies are still in existence. There was a reason why they were telling me to slow down. And there was a reason why I didn't end up in prison. And when I got to INSYS, I got to a company where it was the wild, wild west. I was excited initially that I could do whatever I want. I immediately saw that there were no governors we didn't even have lawyers. We had an HR manager who didn't even have a master's degree who looked like one of these models that you're describing. Um, that's what we had. And I thought, wow, I'm finally going to reach the level of success that I've always attained to, uh, to be at. And instead, I ended up in prison. Because well, no, I mean, first you, you attained that level of success. I mean, I think you're worth like $10 million, right, at one point before you went to prison. And by the way, it doesn't look like you're doing too bad here if this is where you live. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I listen, um, I'm doing okay. I work very hard, harder than I ever have in my life. Mm -hmm. I work hours that I've never worked in my life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it's a different life for me. What, and, do, you, what uh, do you do I, now that, that you work so hard? I'm a broker in the movie and storage business. It's seven days a week from basically mm -hmm. 7 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night. Um, and if I'm not taking calls, it's still going to a live person. Um, people are moving all the time and um, it's just constantly putting out fires and humbling myself and uh, doing things that I never thought I would do. And I don't have secretaries or administrative assistants. I do everything. Um, I have had to learn. I, you know, I'm pretty, uh, pretty mediocre at best as it pertains to computers and so forth like that. So is Carl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I just... I said I pretty much have a mini breakdown every day or at least three, four times a day. I just don't really know what I'm doing, um, but I'm trying to figure my way through it. And I know that I'll never retire. I'll work till, till the day I die. Uh, whereas my only dream for all those years I was working was that I would be able to retire early. Um, and I know now that I'll, I'll never retire. It won't, it's not possible. I'm starting from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I, I would, I would say that would be the case. Um, so look, and, and, you know, looking at your book too, you know, I, I guess you're here to take responsibility and you're, you know, in the book, you're taking responsibility, but I'd make a couple observations uh, that disappointed me. One, John Kapoor is not in the book at all. Michael Babbage is not in the book at all. Sunrise Lee is not in the book at all. You don't even see the word insis in the book. 
uh, it w- was that a was that a a decision made or is that a legal arrangement of some kind? I mean, what the hell's going on? Okay, so it was a decision that I made that I didn't want to expose myself to further uh, legality uh, repercussions, but also. I felt that just because I wanted to come out and tell my story and take responsibility, which you may or may, I know you think is bullshit, but regardless, that's a decision that I made. It's not a decision that I wanted to make on behalf of these other people. Now I realize you can Google any of these people and it will tell the story in five minutes, but at least I'm not exacerbating that and adding fuel to that fire because a lot of these people never want their name mentioned again. And I don't want to, I don't want to be leading towards that. Here's the thing though. If you read the book, I know you only read some of it. I make it very clear who John Kapoor is. I make it very clear who Insus is. I make it very clear who Sunrise is. Um, and I do my best to tell the story, um, you know, as, uh, as effectively as I possibly can. Listen, I know your time is limited. and My book is probably on the lowest part of the totem pole as far as interest to you. Uh-huh. But if you read throughout the entire book, you'll, you'll know exactly who these people are. Well, look, you know, I, I, I may go back and do that because it's not, a, you know, listen, it's not a long book and, no. uh, you know, it flows, uh, you know, I give you that. And, and I don't know that I believe that your, your want, need, desire for redemption is bullshit. I just, I've seen a lot of, in my opinion, half swings in there, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, you mentioned that you saw me on interviews and yeah. you're right. Um, I go back and look at those interviews mm-hmm. and I am, when I first did them and I left and went back to my hotel, I felt okay. Mm-hmm. But when I go back and look at them now, I, yep. I cringe. I'm embarrassed. I don't even know. I'm like, who is that guy? And um, I think that was the guy that uh, led myself and to others to this demise. And it's simply not the guy that I am today because I'm telling you, when I look at those interviews, um, there's no one more shameful than myself. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I guess that's where I derived most of my opinion from. It's just like, you know, I come away from those and, and look, I fully know that when you're doing, you know, 60 minutes or, you know, 20, 20 or any of those things, it's very edited and uh, yeah. for their point of view. Uh, uh and, uh, you know, they all suck. In my opinion, as a matter of fact, I I think sixty minutes, you know, I it che- che- got, cheats cheats the viewers disgusting. by yeah. by never ever actually saying they have a rerun because they change like five minutes of their sixty minutes episode <laughs> at the end, so it always gets recorded on DVR. So that's me calling out sixty minutes uh, 60 for their bullshit. Minutes had me listen to it, mm-hmm. and then I then I called him. And he said, "What do you think?" I said, "I went crazy." I said, you, this is nothing remotely close to what I said. And he, he just said, well, I'm sorry. You have your opinion. I'm angry. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, that's, too you bad. Know, they called you, bro. They called you up and they like wanted you to listen to it. And they're like, oh, he's pissed. Book it. That's yeah, the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, they, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what they're going to do to anybody. Not that, you know, you didn't deserve that. But like, I mean, I you know, they do it to I everybody. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and you probably just didn't know that was coming. You thought you were going to get an honest, fair shake. Clueless. Uh, well, clueless. Well, so now every time I do something, I realize that I'm not going to get an honest fair shake, but I'm still willing to do it because I want people to understand that because I know this, at least maybe I'll get a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Well, where's the guy though? I mean, besides 60 minutes and besides the interviews you did, which, you know, you're not happy with. And I, I found lacking as, as far as sincerity, uh, the guy who actually thought he could work the DOJ. I mean, like the balls on you, pal, that you just walk in that room and, and you think you're working these guys. Um, you know, definitely you have to have balls to do that, but you also have to be a little fucked up in the head. Like in, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying in a go, I'm saying in a, in a way where you're weak and you're already kind of underground grasping for air Mm. by this point i was completely mentally and physically exhausted yeah i just wanted it to to be over and it was my last ditch effort to basically go there and say is there any freaking way i can get myself out of this and if not let's do it you know like let's just call because i was uh i felt like i was paranoid 
I felt like people were listening to me. People were watching me. I, I didn't know what, I just felt like they could show up in my house any day. And I'm the type of person, I'm, I'm a neurotic Jew from New York. If you're going to show up at my house, at least tell me you're coming. Uh -huh. Bring a brisket. Uh, which, by the way, huh? Bring a brisket. Yeah, exactly. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, they would never tell me. They never told me. They just show up at six in the morning. One well, hundred percent, they did, and they yeah. were they were very, very kind in the fact that they they watched me for a while and they knew that my kids went to school uh -huh. and they came after my kids went. Which oh, I, I that's unusual. Appreciate. Yeah, they well, yeah. they must have liked you some way uh, because they literally literally waited for the kids to get dropped off at school and come back home. Well, so, well, well, you did sell them a little bit though because um, who was it? The USDA uh, who crushed Whitey Bulger. He Kind of asked for leniency, didn't he? Yeah. Well, keep in mind, Fred Wyshak was not in the room when I went in the first time to the DOJ to try to get myself out of this mess. He had nothing to do with the case. He was brought in literally years later. Um, and I would like to think that at that point, I was a different person also. And had already basically had, had my come to Jesus point. And when he saw me... He really did meet the Alec Berlikoff that uh, was just really scared shitless and just miserable and remorseful and willing and wanting to do whatever it took um, to try to somehow make good out of this thing, you know, make good out of a horrible, horrible situation. Yeah, he saw something that you didn't really present in the years prior with your I really appearance. believe that. Yeah, I okay. really believe well, that. I mean... It had to be something because, uh, you know, Carl's right. He, he, he did kind of speak up on your behalf, which is pretty unusual. Well, keep uh, in mind, like, for example, Nat Yeager. He's the person that I met the first time and yeah. wasted hours and hours of his time. He was pissed. Because of that, he never forgave me. Yeah, I get no, it. No, no, no matter what I did, I could never turn him around. Yeah, I get it. No, uh, no, and, no. and, yeah, well, I mean, because, really, you went in there and you lied for you know, uh, time after time after time. So with a guy it's like, with, with a guy like that, you're just always going to be a liar. Uh, Correct. so yeah. And you, I guess you had a clean slate with, uh, why check or why cough, whatever his name is. It's sort of, I mean, not really, if you read what I said, but I think, uh, you know, I, I had a tremendous amount of respect for Fred. I, I had fear and respect. I did my research. I knew I was meeting with him. And I just came in with this completely different mentality that either I come across transparent and genuine, or this guy is just going to freaking bury me. Yeah, he would have. Um, and he'd certainly had the ability and the, the knowledge and the expertise and those skills to do, you know, I mean, this guy is, he really is a, uh, he's a genius at what he does. Well, he's a courtroom killer. Yeah. Um, Speaking of that, let's get back to, you know, the Insta story. Um, you're, you started out, I mean, you know, in, in the part of your book I got to, I'm just, you know, I know you're taking responsibility, but they're also, like I said, those interviews I saw were half swings at best. And, you know, it's also, I take responsibility, but, you know, a guy blew cigar smoke in my face and that really fucked me up. Uh, my brother sat on my chest for two hours this guy blew cigar smoke in my face and that really screwed up with my head. And I chose a different career path. Forgetting about the fact that you made thousands of decisions from that moment to the moment you were complicit in a criminal enterprise, your brother who you love very much, you know, I guess picked on you to make you stronger, sat on your chest for two hours at a time, which is physically impossible by the way. But like we, I get the point. None of this was, I mean, these are anecdotal stories, but none of this caused you to do anything that you did. Correct. No, they're just anecdotal stories in an effort to help people understand the writer and maybe um, associate, you know, themselves uh, as a reader. Because um, I always, whenever I read books, I like to be able to say, oh, well, you know, I can relate. Uh, but you're 100% right. None of those uh, give me permission to do any of the things that I did. I was, you know, literally uh, a psychopathic uh, overachiever. Mm -hmm. I just was never friggin' happy. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I feel like in many ways for the first time, I'm happy. Not thrilled, 
<laughs> because I got a lot of shit hanging over my head. But I can sleep at night and I don't wake up in the middle of the night checking voicemail and, and waiting for doctors to call me to go out and take them to strip clubs and entertain them mm. and freaking trying to find an eight ball to, to satisfy somebody's needs. Like I don't live that life anymore. Mm. Um, but I chose that. Life. And I thought that that was the life that was going to make me happy. And, and I'm just telling you, I never was. Those aren't excuses. Again, I was just trying to make myself relatable. Um, you know, keep in mind though, you know, my brother did die, you know, in 2013. Yeah, 2013. He, he, in 2013, um, it was a horrible, horrible incident. Uh, not a drug overdose, I hope. No, it wasn't. Um, but worse, um, he, um, domestic violence and uh, suicide by cop. And, Oof. and again, I'm not proud of this. I don't even want to talk about it. What I'm, what I'm doing is this was in the middle of me working at Insys. Yeah. And it did exacerbate my. What yeah. really sucks is like, you're, you're really saying something very interesting. Uh, that's and compelling it, to me anyway. And then it's, it's just, just frozen and it just, it, I know, it sucks. I know it sucks. Um, uh, well, look, but I was, I, I was saying, um, Dan, you know, anyway, I lost my brother in 2013. He was 40. He left four girls behind, four nieces. Uh, they, they both lost their mother and father. So they were parentless. And um, Oh, wow. I, so, so they passed on the same day in the same event. Same day. The same same day within, within minutes. That, that's got to be traumatic to your entire family. I oh, mean, my mother, yeah. my father. Um, yeah. I mean, my nieces. Death, by, know, my death by cop yeah. is arguably... Actually, I think an overdose is worse, but still, it is. It leaves behind, you know, a real wake for the family yeah. and everybody else. And yeah. I can see to this day that uh, that that hurts. Yeah, yeah. They brought that up at the trial um, when I was testifying, and you know, I lost my ability to um, to really speak. You know, they, you know. Remember at the trial, the trial. Um, as Evan describes, sorry, as Evan described in the trial, I was very erratic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as good lawyers do, they know the right buttons to push. And when they mm -hmm. pushed the buttons around my brother yeah. and went directions where I didn't really feel were necessary, but that's neither here nor there, right? That's mm -hmm. what lawyers do. You know, they got me, they shook me. So again, you're not here to make excuses, just here to kind of tell the whole story. Um, I was extremely driven by money my whole life. Were you on, when, dr were you on drugs then? Um, at the trial? Well, I'm going to ask you two questions. Were you, yeah, on drugs at the trial, Valium no, or whatever, anything? No. Or, and were you on drugs in 2013? Yes, you, yes. During my time at Insys, I was uh, a daily marijuana smoker, mm -hmm. and I used Coke probably every weekend uh, mm -hmm. with, my, with, my, with my physicians that I entertained. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I saw Wolf of Wall Street and I went from using it once a month to, you know, eight days a month. Mm. Uh, uh, but at the trial, no, absolutely not. I was on probation. I was on pretrial probation. I was being tested. I'm well, I mean, tested. you could get prescription drugs. You know, I mean, you could arguably go to your doctor and say, hey, listen, I, I'm under a bit of stress. Let me explain what's going on. And they might they might throw you a what is it, the Valium or uh, Ativan or yeah, whatever that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, to your point there. My whole life, I've been on uh, benzodiazepines. I'm I'm an extremely anxious guy, yeah, and uh, you know, high stress. Uh, it was when I got indicted and I realized I was going to prison. Quite frankly, that I saw a good doctor and said, "Anything scheduled, you got to get me off," because oh. I know they're not going to give that to me in prison, and I don't want to go through withdrawal there. Mm. So I spent a couple of years working feverishly getting off. And anybody who's been on like Xanax or Clonopin, they know it's not easy. And I've been on for 20 years. So um, I have been on, I haven't been on anything scheduled since I was indicted. Uh, did you ever, did you ever try uh subsis? No, I never tried subsis. Uh, the only painkiller I ever tried was Vicodin. Mm. Um, I had, you know, I had some shoulder problems and back and whatever. And a doctor, one of my primaries prescribed me some Vicodin. Um, you know, I'm very well, fortunate. Well, look, 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 talking about subsis for a second, just so we can explain sure. to those who don't really know what it is. It is, you know, at, at times a lethal dose of fentanyl yeah. and, and, and prescribed as an end of life pain alleviating drug for like cancer patients in stage four or whatever. And what you did 
uh, or signed on to and trained others to do was to get doctors to prescribe this off label for knee pain or back pain. Right? Yep. 100% correct. Yep. You know, Alec. First of all, any dose of fentanyl is potentially fatal. Any yeah. dose. And you knew that. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. I, and listen, I, the guy I'm talking to right now, he's no dummy. You knew that. They, yeah. they knew that. Uh, John Kapoor, Michael Babich. Uh, I don't know about Sunrise, but, uh, you know, I, I believe, in my opinion, they knew that and you knew that. And I read in your book that you're very, very remorseful for the harm that this brought to your community. I mean, the reality is, Alec, you killed people. Does that, I mean, do you ever sit down with yourself and say, I killed people? Yeah. Uh, you know, hearing you say it just literally, you know, like just sent shocks to my body. I, it's okay. Look, it's never going to get easy sure. for me to sit across a human being and have them say that to me. That's never going to, it shouldn't be easy. easy. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's very hard for me to even respond. Um, but yeah, the, the response is yes. yes. I mean, you either yeah. have, you either have sat down and which I think you just said and thought, look, if I don't want to put the most colorful colloquialisms on this and say I've harmed a community or whatever, I killed people, you know, right. I'm an accomplice to murder. Uh, and right. that's not to say the Sacklers in my opinion are not, yeah. uh, no, it's, it's not cause I'm talking to you, not them. Right. And you know, your biggest problem was you had 10 million, not 10 billion. Uh, but it didn't help John Kapoor. And, and it, you know, I guess I, I really want to know, cause I follow this story so closely. I know pro arguably a lot more than, than, than the listeners here. Mm -hmm. But what I don't know is what happened in the room with, with, well, why don't we call them those guys? I wouldn't call them John Kapoor or Michael Babbage, but like what happened in the room when you're discussing you know, prescribing this off label and understanding that people will die. I mean, like, you know, can you, can you take us to the murder room, so to speak? Yeah. yeah. People are going to be pissed, right? Um, well, look, this is, is it, is this really about like coming clean or? Yeah, no, it's listen, it's rationalization. Yeah. It's fucking rationalization. Yeah. It's the doctors are prescribing everybody that's on substance was already an addict they're all on 24 hour a day, long acting pain medications. They're opioid tolerant. If it's not substance, it's something else. Um, why shouldn't it be insist that benefits as opposed to Purdue or some other company? It's crap. I literally saw my shrink the other day and yeah. he said to me, Alec, people make forks, people make guns. Forks don't make people fatter. People eat guns. Don't kill. I don't believe I said, doc, I don't want to hear that. That doesn't help. I don't agree. Okay. I am. I do want to take responsibility. I don't need people justifying what took place. That's not going to get me by in life any further, but that, that room was all about giving people like me and everyone else in that room the gravitas, the, the audacity to keep moving forward by blaming everyone but themselves, mm. not taking responsibility, right? We're not putting pen to pen. We're not identifying the patients. Why are these patients, you know, wanting more? Well, they're wanting more because it's fat. Oh, no. Ah. And they're the tolerance and addiction and abuse and misuse and, and everything else that goes along with it. It was just a disaster waiting to happen. And um, I got a seat at the table. And instead of walking away, I literally, you know, got all excited and stood up nice and straight and said, okay, how do I lead the charge? You know, um, and how do I be like the Sackler family? How do I learn from what I thought was their expertise, which now to me is just nothing but disgust? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, was there anybody? The did, did you guys ever walk out of the room with somebody you're closer to than others? I don't know how close you were to Babbage. Uh, I don't think anybody was super close to Kapoor, really. Um, you Maybe know, Babbage. Yeah, but like, did you ever like, you know, your salespeople like have the conversation? Hey, man, you know, people are dying. Listen, let me give props to the vice president of marketing, okay, Anna Paul 
Um, listen, he's not perfect, right? He was involved for a while, but he knew there was a time where he said enough is enough. And if that conversation took place with anybody, it would be with Matt. And by the way, in my opinion, he was the smartest guy in the room, not business wise, but uh, as far as product knowledge, uh-huh. science and so forth. Yeah. So there's uh, no deniability there. When, when you're the smartest guy about a product that kills people, then you just cannot go home and tell yourself this is okay every day. And he walked, he did, you know, maybe not early enough. Right. Yeah. But he did walk. Well, yeah. And he said to me, Alec, you need to walk because he's the reason why I came over. We were at Cephalon together. He reached out to me and asked, said, I have an opportunity. He felt responsible to tell me. And yeah. I, I basically golfed at him. Yeah. I'm like, what are you crazy, man? This is the opportunity of a lifetime. We're on the, we're on the brink of millions here. We're not, I'm not leaving now. Yeah. You know, we got to see this through. And he, he left and he's the only one who wasn't indicted. And some people say he should have been indicted. By the hair of his chinny chin chin, man. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, you know, he, he was very, very close. Yeah. And there were just, you know, I mean, look, there were, there were, there were complicit people. And, you know, when I have these conversations, like, you know, I, I don't know if you know Barry Minkow, but he was my last guest. No. And he was uh, one of the original fraudsters back in the early eighties. He, he took a company public at 21. That was a fraud. That's, wow. that's guts, right? He started fraud right. at 16, but you know, the theme here is there's always a good reason for it and I'm going to do more good with it and I'm going to pay it back or, you know, the kind of justification that was going on in that room that you're talking about and the, but like, you know, when you're in that room and you're saying, I'm not putting pen to pad is, is what, what's being said. No, but you're bribing doctors. If that's not putting pen to pad, you know, I don't know what it is. You're, you're playing games with the insurance company. Who was that phone bank you had? What was that lady that ran it? Liz. Yeah. yeah. A script or, or a script, I think. Yeah. The spiel. The spiel. Yeah. The spiel. Yeah. 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 Listen, I talked to you about it. In my opinion, another person who was in the same category as Sunrise, where basically got herself into a heap of trouble and really had no idea what was going on uh, in a, in, to a large extent. Would be Liz. Well, uh, listen, uh, I, I've done phone sales. I've done all kinds of sales. You know, you talked, you did car sales. I, I've done it all. And, you know, going from a 30% close rate effectively with insurance companies to 87%, that, yeah. <laughs> that's one hell of a script. Man. That, that's, that's knowing the system inside and out. And Well, yeah. look, look, I mean, I don't, I, I see your point. Alec, actually. And by the way, Carl, I think you'd have been Alec's top salesperson and taken it all to the bank until you got indicted, too. Oh, I would have flipped, too. Yeah. You, you, actually, you, you, would, you would have turned on Alec. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so, but I, I by see. By the way, you know that everyone turned on me, right? Before. I, well, they turned on you. To, you, were, you were the fall guy. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I, I and do. We, let me just finish with Liz. Of- I understand yeah. that Liz yeah. was gaming insurance companies like people in Liz's business do all the time. What Liz maybe didn't understand is how dangerous this drug was because she really just worked the phones, you know, and, and, and the spiel. Uh, yes, I do understand that, you know, uh, likely Babbage and Kapoor are like, Hey, you know, do you want to go to jail? No, I don't want to go to jail. Do you want to go to jail? No, I don't want to go to jail. Um, well, you know, (laughs) who's up? How about Alec? (laughs) You know, and I think that's what happened. And you were like, hey, you know, you know, uh, I'm not a big dummy here and I see where this is going. And you seem to understand the difference between, you know, a subject subpoena from the DOJ and, you know, a witness subpoena uh, for the DOJ or informational. uh, And, you know, when you're a subject, it's tough. Well, I mean, listen, guys. We. When we were all indicted prior to Kapoor, Kapoor was indicted a year later, but we were all indicted. We were still in a joint defense agreement. Yeah. Okay. I didn't decide to plead guilty immediately. Okay. I'm not going to tell your listeners, oh, I just immediately wanted to take responsibility. You know, it didn't happen that way. We, oh, no, I trying to get out of here. Hell, you, you, I didn't know what the hell You to broke do. the I, defense I, agreement by, by like walking into the DOJ and representing no, yourself, didn't really, didn't you? I didn't break the defense agreement. Okay. But we were all in a joint defense agreement. And then when Kapoor got indicted and his lawyer came along, uh-huh. she said to everyone, we're going to break the defense agreement with Alec and we're going to serve him up on a server platter. Oh, yeah. 
That's what happened. So at this point, I'm no longer in the joint defense and I'm out there on my own. And clearly it's obvious yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. So I, I toughed it out as long as I could um, until my lawyer said, Oh, <laughs> there is no joint defense agreement. Yeah. They Kapoor came along, the lawyer came along and they said, we're done with Alec. We're now in a joint defense agreement. Alex on his own. So I can, so, I can see so why Joe, you would have wanted to stay. You would have wanted to stay in it, but you, you understand that, that, you know, this last minute of, of an explanation, which I, I see wholly as honest as, as most of your interview here, like, not like what I've seen in the past. Um, it's, it's not a very likable thing to say, I turned on the, I turned in the last minute when I knew it was going to be me, but if it was going to be somebody else, well, screw them. Well, yeah. I mean, Joe and Sunrise and people that I was close to that I was in a joint. Oh yeah. With, I forgot about him. Yeah. Even Babbage, you know, who I wasn't, I didn't have a long-term friendship with, but I still felt like we were tight and we had met many times after I had left the instance. Once when they all turned on me, you know, my lawyer pulled me aside and said, listen, you know, you got to listen to me. Man. You, you need to think hard and long about pleading guilty, right? Because this is where you're at right now. Um, you don't have the luxury of John Kapoor and his lawyer on your team. In fact, you have the opposite. You have John Kapoor and his lawyer against you, mm -hmm. right? So, Listen, I'm just here to be honest. You know, um, yeah. I was devastated when Joe specifically mm -hmm. decided to do that. What was Joe's uh, last name again? Rowan. Joe Rowan. Rowan. Yeah, he, right. he he doesn't really come off as a a villainous guy um, so much no, as he doesn't. Joe is Joe is the most likable guy you'll ever meet in your life. He's the life of the party. He he never. He, I know he was involved in this, and I'm not here to defend him, but. He has never presented as a man who was out to hurt anybody. Um, again, he, he was just in the got room. He was in the room, Alec. No, hundred percent. He okay. got caught up. Yeah, in, we can't uh, be in the and, murder room and and not be yeah. out to hurt somebody. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Listen, I'm not here to defend anybody, and I'm not here to defend myself. I really am. Believe it or not, I really am here to take responsibility. I I'm I'm feeling it. I really am. Uh, it, it's you know, and I, and I know it hasn't been easy. But, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that were really done here. I mean, like, you know, I mean, we got to the bribing of the doctors. I mean, there's also like, you know, you're just taking these doctors who are, you know, obviously social misfits and, and, oh, by the way, your rep is, you know, a hot stripper uh, and playing on that person's emotion. That guy went to jail, right? The guy in Saginaw, Michigan or something. I mean, yeah, he got the nailed. Guy, the guy in Michigan did go. Yeah. The one that you're talking. I think you're referring to another doctor who supposedly was given a lap dance. He didn't go. No, I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean they were given a lap dance or whatever, but like the attention that they get from, you know, this person is not the attention they get in real life. And it really pulled at their heart. I mean, it just, the yeah, lives that were devastated. Right. I mean, manipulate manipulation at its finest. Right. And manipulation at its finest. Did you, and, um, Mm -hmm. What are, you know, have you ever thought or have you ever done just putting it out there? Reaching out to somebody who, you know, um, a family that, you know, somebody died of an overdose of insis and just said, look, for my part, I'm sorry. Right. It's interesting. Um, no, because I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to. Gosh, that'd be to, tough. To put myself in spots where. I could potentially, somebody could react and they, I violate probation. I don't know. I know that might sound like an excuse, but I'm very fearful. Yeah, that's that. an excuse. Uh, uh, being be afraid is not an excuse, but saying you're going to violate your probation for apologizing is, meh. Well, oh, here's what I do do, though. Yeah. Interestingly enough. Ironically enough. Yeah. So I work in moving and storage. Uh -huh. I work in a phone room with 35 guys. Uh -huh. 30, at least, are recovering addicts, uh -huh. and they literally uh they go back into addiction yeah unfortunately yeah every four six months that's the statistics um, right that's that's my good happen, buddy yeah. Yeah. i lost two already in the yeah. past two years i lost chad um i lost eric dangler and i and my buddy Andy just relapsed again and has pneumonia and is 
literally barely breathing. He just relapsed last week. Well, let's let's take his last name out. He didn't. He's he wasn't part of Insys. Yeah, I'll, I'll let <laughs> no, you no, that out. But I I and I texted I texted one of my guys that passed. Yeah, uh, and I said, listen, you're gonna die. You need to get your shit together. You're yeah. gonna die. Yeah. Call me, text me. I will come over. He died that night. This <sighs> is just in the past two years. So I am hypersensitive to addiction, and I am looking at it every day in that phone room. And you know why they hire these people? Because yeah. they're the best salespeople out there. They're freaking, they work 24 seven. They're insane. They make tons of money and then they go relapse. They go to recovery. They go to rehab and they blow it all and they do it again. So these same people are being taken advantage of every day. Also the world that we live in and the, and the things that I see and the eyes that are now open to all of this, to what's going on. It's, it, it just has my mind just freaking going a mile a minute. Well, a- addicts, addicts are the best salespeople because they're, you know, they're <clears throat> constantly selling their family and their loved ones that they're not an addict. Number one, right. selling themselves that they're not an addict. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess that benefits your business. Hopefully I, you I have a program to get I, these people help. You know what? I'll be honest with you. What I've seen, I think rehab is the biggest scam out there. It's pretty All bad. I see, huh? It's pretty bad. Yeah. All I see is them taking people's money and then they keep relapsing. So yeah. I don't see it. And I, um, we I, definitely need to relook I, I, at how addiction is served, uh, and how to get over it. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I took this job, the owner said, you know, we're not going to publicize who you are because we got a lot of guys in here who, um, you know, are addicts and yeah. we don't know how they're going to perceive you. We don't think they're going to like you. We don't think they're going to welcome you. Well, over time, I managed to, you know, be okay with these guys. But and but they all asked me, they're like, have you ever been an addict? They're like, no. Like, I'm very, thank God, I'm fortunate that, no, I don't suffer from addiction. And I've dabbled. And I could have fell down that slippery slope. Mm. I said, but I've seen, and I've seen a lot of horror stories. I've seen a lot of people die. I've heard a lot of people die. I don't want to see you guys die. Mm. You know, and I'm here to help you in any way I can. But I'll be honest with you, I don't really uh, feel very confident about my ability to help or anybody else. I think addiction is uh, probably the most deadly and difficult diseases that is that exist out there today. Ironically, coming from you. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's a very experienced opinion. Uh, and, and you've seen a lot of it. Uh, you know, and, and you did what? Uh, how, many, how many months in prison did you do? Was it? I was sentenced for 26. I got, I did 10 inside. I got off of good behavior. I did nine in the halfway house, three on home confinement. So I served 22 of the 26 and I'm on probation now. So you only actually did 10 months inside. Yeah. And, um, I mean, you know, nothing but not, not admiration, but nothing but respect for the people who were in there for five, 10, 20 years. My buddy just got out last week after doing nine uh, it's a miserable experience. You can call it a camp. You can call it whatever you want. Um, but you know, prison. there's nothing, there's nothing easy about being taken away from the people that you love. That's the bottom line. No, that's the hardest part about being put no. in prison. But, but, uh, but I'll say you were extremely lucky. Yes, and, I was. Uh, and, and you know, I, that could have day and I try to, uh, I try, I'm trying to do whatever I can to take the tremendous fortune that I've been allotted and make the most of it. Well, you know, look, I, I, I do wish you the best of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't come in to this interview with bias. Um, you know, not, you know, it just maybe also because I followed insist through their, their, their rise. And, you know, we knew what was going on. I mean, did you realize the short sellers were onto you guys? Was, was that ever a conversation in the room? Uh, not in the room. I mean, I realized I was kind of like following that and saw Roddy Boyd was all over it. Yeah. yeah. And kind of got freaking nervous because I know like what he's capable of. Yeah. And And then sure enough, he actually did reach out to me and, you know, just... Really, really me, very unsavvy, you know, never really. Did you talk to him? I don't remember. I mean, I, did. I, I know Roddy, Biggest he's a good thing. guy. So, so oh, no, no, Roddy's a good guy. We're, I, I love him now. Like we've had many yeah, but during During this period, when, and you say you're following it. So you knew who Roddy Boyd was yeah. when you took the call. Yeah. But you took the call anyway. 
I called him back. Yeah. 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 Can I just can I just throw out there that that was dumb. I mean, I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, we love Roddy, but <laughs> yeah, but like you know, th- this guy, this guy knew the score, and he was going to try and put you under for all the right reasons. Yeah, he chewed but you me called up him back. Yeah, he chewed me up and ate me for breakfast because he was. Right I bet he was sweet as hell to you when you had your conversation, right? You thought he was. You know, friendly? believe it or not, no, he came across a little hard. He oh, did he, he right away really? had a bit of chip on his shoulder. He was already pissed oh. and looking looking for blood. Yeah, he was looking for blood. Uh. Um, I think that he kept his composure, but I wouldn't say he was sweet. Yeah, well, there definitely is that side to him, but it's generally not in the first conversation of a, of a subject. Uh, but yeah, Roddy can Roddy can lose his temper. Yeah, I think you know he was. He, I, I I have to let him speak to it, but you know, I mean, I think the sunrise thing really annoyed him too. Um, mm. That and and then the doctors that are being bribed. What are those mm. two guys in Alabama? I guess it was that were just. I mean. I mean, Dr. Was, Ron and Couch, Dr. Ron and Dr. Couch. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and look, this, I was pitched this, the INSIS short multiple times uh, mm-hmm. by multiple people. And um, for me, it was like, okay, once the third or fourth kind of, a, you know, idea generator is coming to you with the same idea, it becomes a race to the finish. I, I mean, mm-hmm. the conclusion is going to be there. And you can't really short it on spec waiting for it to happen, especially if Roddy's writing it, because he'll take his sweet time. He's not really investing in it. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I'm just not the fastest at getting things done like that because, I, you know, I, I need to be careful. But I still mm-hmm. followed it, and right. I knew what was going on. And, you know, I mean, you'd see the video. Whose idea was that fucking video? Yeah, so... Of, you know, the guys dancing around to a rap song in Insys, you know, suits. I mean, uh, yeah, cartoon by suits. By the way, that wasn't me. Not that you, were, you weren't in the suit? No, no. What, no. Uh, Alec, was it your idea, though? Fuck no. Okay. God, no, no. I didn't have time for that shit. No. Well, I mean, um, listen, you're a VP of marketing. I mean, that, that's, no, that's marketing. I, I'm, I'm focused on the numbers. Yeah. But believe me when I tell you, anybody knows me. No, I don't get involved in that. How did that, no. go, over, how did that go over at your meeting? Did, was anybody at the meeting like, okay, this is... This is stupid. No, a couple, listen, what happened was, you know, we got a bunch of girls in the office. Uh, yeah. I remember the girl, uh, Amber and Kristen, sweethearts. They were like secretaries, administrative assistants, trying to take initiative. And, you know, uh, what are we going to do for the meeting and create hype and blah, blah, blah. And they said, hey, you know, we're going to we're gonna send out an email to everybody. We're going to offer a stipend to anybody that sends in a five-second clip of a, a message around, I think, being built. Oh, titration. Titration, duh. Right. Yeah. So everybody sent in a five second clip and these two guys um, who were, you know, super savvy and good looking and talented and have all the resources in Orlando. They put together this crazy video and they went all out and they sent it in and everybody in the office, quite frankly, was at all yeah. like thought it was the greatest thing they ever saw. And they're like, we're going to show this at the national sales meeting. <laughs> do you, so do you, it doesn't surprise me that those pigs thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, I show up at the national sales meeting, I get to my room and like 10 minutes later, there's a knock on the door. The mm. two guys who made the video are sitting there with the head of the costume. <laughs> they had it shipped out there. They had it shipped from Orlando to Arizona. Mm. I'm like trying to prepare for my talk, to be honest with you. I'm getting myself a little, you know, a little hyped up here and yeah. really <laughs> focused. And they come in and they're like, dude, you got to do us a favor. I'm like, what? And they're like, Berlikoff, you got, it'll be solid if you just put this on and we film like the final scene of you taking it off, you know, for pretending. As a matter of fact, will I shatter this rap, let's shatter and grasp my delivery. It's giving me 38% of this industry plus my availability. I'm built to last, y'all can't get rid of me. Not even be sick of me. But attacking me is actually practically just a silly compare and acting me. Y'all sick of me. This ain't no fight at all. And if you're trying to ball, I'll substitute you like it was xylitol. Look, I, I know I, I, I'm, I'm now an expert at like where you were. <laughs> so they come to your room and... They're like, hey, put the suit on, and then we're just going to film you for a second taking the, the, the head of this suit off. So it looks like you were in it the whole time. But meanwhile, you were annoyed because you were getting ready for your, your speech and doing lines. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they showed up with two girls who were going to hold the cameras, and they had the head of the costume, and they're like, Berlikoff, you got to do it. I'm like, I'm like, ask Babbage. I'm like, he's the CEO. They're like, yeah, no, you're the VP of sales. Like, if anybody's going to do it, it's you. I'm like, you got five minutes. Let's go. You know, and, you know, Did, next thing you know, it's all over TV. Was you it, know, Berlikoff in the, in the costume yeah. dancing like a fool. But listen, you know, I mean, it, 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 it looked really bad at the trial. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. It looked horrible, not yeah. just at the trial, everywhere. Yeah, I no, mean, I mean, cool. well, yeah, it looked, it, I mean, for me, you know, the, the whole video was really bad. And then, you know, you being in there is not a big surprise, like, yeah, to, to believe it. But, like, you know, the greater picture is people dying. Uh, but was that the yeah. culture? Was that the culture that, like, I mean, was Babbage doing lines of cocaine before his speeches, too? Was everybody nah. just fucked up? No, no, no. That was you were just trying great. to numb yourself and self medicate at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Remember, again, this is an excuse, though. I don't like going there. But no matter what I did for Kapoor, it wasn't enough. Yeah. You know, again, did you have a, did you have a daddy thing. complex thing with him? Does it, did, he, did he try to create that kind of aura that I'm everybody's parent, you need to please me? Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, daddy complex also, you're trying to get accepted, but you're also, he's very serious about firing. Remember, I replaced the VP, right? So yeah. if you don't produce, you're fired. He has no problem doing that. Um, He'd and have done then you the a favor. other thing, huh? He'd have done you a favor. He would have done me a huge favor, huge favor. Would have changed my whole life forever. Yeah. Um, but no, he didn't fire me. And um, you know, like the reimbursement. You know, we were at thirty percent, fifty percent. He kept wanting to go higher and higher, and I kept saying, "You're fucking nuts, dude!" Like we were at twenty five percent at Cephon, and everybody made a fortune, and everybody was happy. You want to be at ninety? Like that doesn't make sense. Like again, that was like one specific area where I knew he was going way further than I was ever. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter what I, did, what I did, it was never enough. And, you know, I knew when I went up on stage for a national sales meeting, everyone always said, those meetings, Alec, that's you. That's your job. Yeah. That's not the CEO. Mm -hmm. That's not the managed care guy. That's not the finance guy. That's your show. You better make it work. It happens once a year. I dreaded it. And I did my best to get through it. And I used whatever defense mechanism or coping me mechanism I could get my hands on. That's fair. I mean, that's fair and honest. I was, you know. Um, I went seven days straight with no sleep at those meetings. Seven days straight, no sleep. That's, you know? that's probably not smart. I mean, it, not, it doesn't make for the, I mean, look, you're a great salesman. Everybody would say, everybody says that, like when they talk about you and, you know, putting a presentation on probably you know, isn't the most difficult thing for you, even though I'm sure you, you really prepare yourself. Uh, but it, it can't be great when you've done it on seven days, no sleep. I mean, no, it was, it, it was, it was that just more pressure than it was anything else. Um, I'd say 50% pressure from the outside and 50% pressure from myself. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know, wherever it comes from. Yeah. It's, it's all pressure. It's a hundred percent pressure. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, like, you know, You've talked about it in your book. I mean, you you're you've always been your worst own worst critic. I believe that. Um, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Interestingly, people will will read in your book that <laughs> that you came from an affluent family on one hand, especially on your uh, paternal and maternal grandfather's sides. And and then they they blew it all away either gambling or one of your grandfathers was, you know, kind of the lawyer to the mob? Yeah. He, um, yeah. My grandfather was, uh, was an attorney for organized crime. Uh -huh. Um, but you know, that's really all I know. You know, there's a lot of talk out there that I spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, I really don't know much about it. Um, I do know that, you know, I was bar mitzvah and there were people there that clearly were, you know, friends of my grandfather and clearly, clearly not Jewish. <laughs> not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> not Jewish. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've been at the table and heard many stories and enjoyed hearing my grandfather talk. And I very much looked up to him. So he and, glorified, um, he glorified that life to you. He did. Um, but really, it was my father hmm. who glorified that life. It was my father who I think um, envied his father. Right. You right. know, and he never did, he wanted did, to your let Your father didn't envy the IRS, though. <laughs> no, no. And I mean, Evan Hughes, 
Evan Hughes did a lot of research on that. He didn't really put it in his book, but yeah. he shared with me a lot of things. Evan did a really good job researching my grandfather mm-hmm. as well as my father. Pretty thorough guy, isn't he? Very thorough. Yeah. Very. Well, I mean, Talk look about a workaholic. Evan's he, a workaholic. Yeah. I, I, I got that impression from talking to him, but it, it looks like you you grew up in what you could look back now should have been a cautionary tale of this excess seems like a good idea. seems like it's getting you to the end result and it always fails in the end, yeah. whether, yeah, it does. whether it ends up in prison or it ends up in, you know, you know, one taking one's own life or thing. I mean, it's a very common thing with that kind of excess. And it seemed to like surround you growing up too. And you just didn't catch on or, or you did. And you just, you passed all the guardrails anyway. Yeah. Um, all I know is, I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is that I'd like to think that what happened, the, what I just went through was God's way of, for whatever reason, taking pity on me. And saying, I'm going to send you to prison to finally freaking get your attention and knock some sense into you. And this is your last chance. Were you religious before you went to prison? No, I wasn't religious before I went to prison. I'm not religious now. I mean, I believe in God. I believe in God. I've always believed in God, but that doesn't make me religious in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm with you, man. I definitely want to believe in God. I (laughs) definitely admire people who who have that, who have that faith. I I wish I did. (laughs) You know, if you don't have a higher power, then you think that, you know, you're in charge of all your decisions and the the buck stops there. Right. Right. So I I don't believe that. I know that, uh, you know, that's not the case. Well, look, I at least believe it's both because you, I mean, look, Alec, if, if gosh, I hope if you learned anything, God's not in charge of your decisions. You are right. And all of those decisions, good and bad you know, brought you to where you are today, which is from what you're saying is maybe one of the best places you've been. Yeah. So, you know, good for you. Um, everybody deserves redemption after they, they, they paid their price. I personally think you got off light, but that's not my decision. Right. So the, the case was adjudicated. You did your time. You deserve another shot at life. Um, you know, if, if it ever comes up that it could be cathartic for somebody for you to talk to them and maybe take it on the chin, mm-hmm. you know, I, I could definitely see what you're saying though, uh, Alec, that like, you know, if you, if you called me and, and my brother or one of my family members had, had died on Insys and, and you sincerely wanted to apologize, I'd rip you a new asshole, but maybe that's what I needed. And that's what you're giving people. I think a lot of other people would surprise you and are, are better than I am uh, and wouldn't do that. Uh, the steps you're taking here, though, I think are admirable. I, you know, I, I, I do view you, um, you know, much more genuine today uh, than I've seen in clips and interviews in the past. Uh, and I, I hope that that genuine person stays, stays true. I mean, I guess there's one last thing I wanted to know from my perspective, and then you can tell us anything you you want to talk about have you ever spoken to sunrise lee or or joe any of these people again that you're i mean i don't i don't i don't think john or babbage who gives a shit uh (laughs) but have you ever spoken to them again no um yeah i would love to i don't think either one of them would ever want to speak to me again you know you need to stop that alec yeah. You need listen, you you ran through every barrier in life w- without mm-hmm. caution. You got to run through this one because you know, you might get rejected, but people can still surprise you if you're this genuine. Mm-hmm. Uh if they see maybe a different Alec. And look, if it's if you don't think it'll be good for you, then that's your decision. But right. don't tell yourself that you're not going to do something because of what you think other people are going to do. Right. Um, no, it would be good for me. Um, I would love to. And, um, you know, people close to me ask me, you know, are you ever going to reach out to Joe? Are you going to ever reach out to Sunrise? Um, I always say, you know, I don't know. That's, that's to be honest, uh, truth. You know, there's, um, you know, I'm fearful, right? Um, there's another part of me, quite frankly, that thinks, 
um, that I might be able to help. You know, I'm still a very tenacious man, and um, I've found ways to, uh, you know, find different ways to be successful and uh, do it in a in a way that's obviously not going to be uh, cause trouble. And um, I, you know, I don't know where they're at and if they would, you know, need anything like that. But you know, um, I don't know, uh, Dan. We'll see. Well, listen, maybe they're one of the five people that that uh, watch my show, uh, <laughs> and uh, and they'll reach out to you. Uh, you know, I mean, I can tell you if, if either one of them ever asked me for assistance in any way, shape, or form, and I could provide it, I wouldn't think twice. I have, uh, I think I, believe I was that. hurt. I believe that I was hurt when you know the thing with the joint defense agreement went crumbling down. But I understand that, quite frankly, Kapoor was calling the shots, and Sunrise and Joe had to do what they had to do to protect themselves and their family. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I'm over. Alex, I got to say, looking at the emotion, Al Alec. Al Alec, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Alec, I, I have to say, looking at the emotion, just even thinking about it, it tells me that you have to. Decisions there because you're not at peace with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. well, look at Carl making a good point. Yeah. Well, you know, I think there's certain things in life. I mean, you hear the term come to peace with things, but. You know, for personally, I feel like there's certain things in my life that have occurred that I'll probably never necessarily come uh, to total peace with. And yeah. that's something that I have to live with. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fair. Everybody's got their own life to lead. And, you know, coming to peace, you know, maybe sometimes causes you to come to peace is, and it may, it may not right. be worth it. Um, but, you know, for, you know, for what it's worth, I, you know, I hope you do well. If for no other reason, Alec, I've seen you not do well. And mm -hmm. that didn't end well for a lot of people, you know, including you and your family. I really hope you do well. And I, and I think that, man, you have so many skills where that's concerned that, you know, you put that drive to use. I bet you're doing well with what you're doing right now. And I appreciate your candor. I appreciate you coming here, understanding that this was literally going to be the wolf den for you. Mm hmm and I don't think you pulled any punches and you were not full of shit. Uh, and I want to thank you for that. I appreciate, uh, you know, everything you said here at the end and uh, giving me the opportunity to, uh, you know, try to try to do what's right. Well, do you have anything to say to, you know, our listeners? Um, do you, you know, look, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it, you know, talk about your book for a second or where they can follow you. You have a Twitter handle or something of of that nature. Um, you know, I mean, listen, I'm not here to sell books. My book is, you know, I give it to free. Anybody who wants it for free, you can just email me at training at aberlikoff.com. I'll send you a free copy, um, and then I'll uh, I'll welcome your feedback, good, bad, or indifferent. That's well, that's, that's nice it. You. Um, you know, I just um, just just really just a guy who uh, has has issues like a lot of people in this world and uh, trying to do my best to manage them and uh, move forward in, in a way that's going to be beneficial for me, everyone I come in contact with. And, and to be honest, most importantly, um, my two daughters, my 15 yeah. year old and my 21 year old. Oh, geez. Yeah. I, I and yeah. my nieces, my four nieces. So, um, you know, I have not done anything uh, to help the Berlikoff name and, you know, they carry it. So, um, you know, Got to try to do what's right moving forward. Yeah. I feel like that's a big deal too. Uh, I, you know, I remember when I, I had to move away from Michigan to California, you know, one of the last things my father said to me before he put me on a plane and kicked me out of the state mm -hmm. is uh, your last name is my last name and you take care of it. Yeah. And you know, maybe you didn't, but that doesn't mean you can't redeem it. Um, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, uh, you know, definitely didn't do, do a good job, but, uh, you know, to be fair, you know, I don't think, uh, the people before me that carried the name did such a wonderful job. I think that, <laughs> you, know, it, you know, we really need to turn everything upside down and, uh, start over. And that's really what I want, uh, to pass down to my daughters and my nieces that you know, we've got to do everything different. Anything you want to say to the families of people that, I mean, you know. I feel like no matter what I say is going to come across disingenuous because I have never suffered from addiction. Um, and I feel like you need to, to really understand, but uh, I'm trying to 
really understand the best I can as an outsider and, and an observer. And um, it just seems just so horrible and so debilitating. And, and it seems like complete torture. And I wish that I uh, understood that when I was doing what I was doing, because I think that I would have taken a very different path. I, for me, I just would have quite frankly resigned and taken a job with another company that had like a, uh, you know, antihypertensive or cholesterol lowering agent. I mean, <laughs> there's plenty of drugs out there that I could have done uh, and, and not literally seen people die. So, uh, you know, I'm nothing but sorry. And um, that's it. Again, right I have to there, live right with that there. for the rest of my life. Right, right there, Alec. That's it. Yeah. Listen, man. I'm in no position to give you advice, but if I was going to give you one piece of advice, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overthink that answer. I would just say two words. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and, and let them take it from there. And, and I think you are sorry. Uh, and I, and I hope that the rest of, you know, if, if, if Babbage or Kapoor, when he gets out, if he's still talking, you know, I, I'm happy to have them on here and it's not going to be easy for them either. Uh, mm -hmm. but props to you, buddy. Thanks mm -hmm. for coming on. Um, I wish you a good life and, uh, you, your family, your daughters, your nieces, uh, you deserve a good turn at this point.